I studied architecture in UCD, entering in September, October of 1973. Um, great class, people like Michael McGarry, uh, Valerie Mulvin, Shoni Aini were my classmates. Most of Group 91 were in the school at the time. Derek Tynan was in second year, Paul Kyo in second year, John and Sheila were in third year, Shelley Yvonne and Shay Cleary were in fifth year. Um, and by the time I got to fourth year, uh, Shelley and Yvonne and Tony Murphy, who was one of the other founders of Grafton Architects, were my teachers. But in my first year, my teachers, two great teachers, were Shane de Blackham and Pat Hickey. And on our first day in Earlsford Terrace in the, in the basement, um, uh, Pat Hickey gave us a talk about what we should expect from our first year. And he handed out a reading list of 20 novels. And he said, if you read half of these, you'll have had a good year in college. So there was a cinema, an international art house cinema, just across the road from, um, from, from the studios in Elsford Terrace. And it was a regular thing for us. It showed uh, foreign language films with subtitles. Uh, I think it was called the International Film Theatre. It's now the Sugar Club, uh, part of the Sugar Building, uh, Sugar Company Building. Uh, it was regular at five o'clock that you know, half a dozen of us would go over, catch an Agnes Varda film, Morning Mar Bergman or Federico Fellini and then come back into the studio until we were thrown out at half nine, a quarter to ten, and go home at that stage. So it was, it was much more than architecture, it was like, like in the city. Um, but I got to know Belfield a little bit around about that time, particularly from, yeah, 73, 74, my first year. I was the only uh, person in first year who was on the architecture soccer team, part of the UCD Super League. Uh, Tony Reddy, who was in fourth year, had, had invited me onto the team and we became friends through that. Um, but the matches were all out here in Belfield. So we would come out to Belfield on, on Saturdays for our matches and kit out in uh, porta cabins beside the science building. Uh, it was a big windswept area with loads of pitches. Uh, there was no, no sports building out there. The water tower was the only structure um, between that and the, the science buildings, which were the first buildings on campus. So I would come out for that. And then Tony was uh, very heavily involved in student politics. He was on the SRC, the Student Representative Council. And uh, he was asked in 1974, for the year 74, 75, to stand for president of the SRC. And he would have been the first architect since John O'Reilly in the 1950s to have had a role at that level in student politics but Tony being Tony was always very organized and he was finishing fourth year and he just said he wasn't going to take a year out effectively to do student politics before uh, moving on to complete his thesis so he declined the offer and then he asked me if I would put my name forward to stand to represent architecture for the SRC and nominations had to be in at I think it was 12 o'clock on a Friday and about two o'clock on that Friday in the, in the studio. John Toomey and Sheila arrived down into the studio because John wanted to put his name in the ring. He had to go around to Newman House to, to register as a candidate. And all, all signed off by, you know, porters. And it was all official, it wasn't done by students. Um, and he said he had been around and they said he had missed the deadline. The only way uh, that the name could be reinstated would be if I would come around and agree that he'd be a candidate. But, we were all going to Valerie Mulvan's holiday house in, in Wexford later that afternoon with no time. So that was uh, my first kind of uh, relationship with John Toohey, but it, it improved from then on. But it meant I was on the SRC for two years um, it, during the time when it transform, transformed itself from the Student Representative Council to the Students' Union of today. Um, so I would come out to Belfield for all the meetings, which were in the, the basement, one of the big theatres in the basement of uh, the Arts Block, and got to know people because uh, Earlsford Terrace was very remote. There were the meds and ourselves were in Earlsford Terrace. Um, that was it. The engineers were in Merrion Street, and we used to go over to, which is now government buildings, and we used to go over to Merrion Street for our structures uh, lectures. Um, but everyone else by that stage was, by the end of the 70s, was, was in Belfield. So I got to know, you got to know people from other, from other faculties and, you know, it was interesting, a lot of them went on to amazing things, like the president of the, the SOC in my first year was Adrian Hardiman, who later became Supreme Court judge and expert on James Joyce. Um, Michael McDool, who became Attorney General, Jerry Danaher, Bannister, Betty Purcell, who was the producer on 
um, what was the political debate show on the huge one on RTE television, um, Primetime. So she was, she was the producer on Primetime for about 20, 25 years. Julian Vinyls went into radio production, made some beautiful uh, documentaries. So you, you, you got to know people from, from other, other faculties. And then in the second year that I was on that, that was uh, 75, 76. So that was my, my third year in college. Second year I was on the SRC. That was the biggest, that was the, that was the, the game changer for, for our generation of, of students. It was the occupation of five houses in Pembroke Street, just around the corner from the US for Terrace studio. At the instigation of Bolton Street students, I have to say, they, they were going in and they had made contact with Michael DeCourcy and Michael DeCourcy stood on some drafting tables in the second year studio one afternoon and said the occupation was going to take place in the next 20 minutes and he was going and the whole studio walked out. It was February in 1976 and we walked over to Pembroke Street and we walked in the door of the building and occupied it. The floorboards had been ripped up by, by the builders because demolition had already begun, partial demolition, but the roof was sound. And most of us, I think, thought we were going home that, uh, that afternoon. Um, but that was early February and the occupation didn't end until late April. Uh, so we were there for about 10 weeks. Um, but in the end, Board of agreed not to knock the buildings. And Sam Stevenson, who was their architect, was retained by them as an architect. And they subsequently built the Board of headquarters beside Robin Walker's Board Fulcher, former Board Fulcher building uh, up near Baggett Street Bridge. So that changed us really as a generation um, of architects uh, to starting to believe that we had to work with the city and work with historic fabric rather than just inserting new modern contemporary architecture. So it changed the mindset completely. Other people who were in on the occupation, Michael DeCourcy was the, was the leader of the UCD side, Philco Burlachan, uh, and Jerry Tierney were the leaders from, um, from Bolton Street. But Joe Little, who later became religious uh, affairs correspondent with RTE, Joe was heavily involved in student politics in UCD, so he kind of came in for a while and tried to as the politicians always do, take the thing over at, at, at the start, but he was, he was repulsed and it was just the architects. So we, we had to organise a rota um, because we had to sleep in the building. I mean, if, if, if the building was unoccupied at any moment, it would have been taken back and demolished. So we had to organise a rota and the, the, the top floor became basically the bedrooms. At the start, we all slept in the, in the, the main rooms on the first floor in sleeping bags, but then it kind of broke down into people had particular rooms on the top floor and there were stalwarts who were there pretty much 24-7. Um, interestingly, two schoolgirls from Muckross came in uh, to join us. Uh, they were the Sweetman twins, Caroline and Michelle Sweetman, and Caroline later ended up marrying Sam Stevenson. Um, so there was, so they, would, they would go off to Muckross to school in the morning and come back and uh, other people would come in and stay for a night or come in at the weekend and stay for a night or come in and, and do a day shift. Um, but you always had to have about 10 or 12 people in the building at any time because the door had to be kept secure and uh, you couldn't go down and just open the door willy-nilly because anyone could barge in um, and evict you. Um, so people brought their drawing boards into Pembroke Street, were doing their projects from there and, and all of that. So it was. It was very exciting, but as part of that, um, the architects drew attention to themselves within UCD. And one of the big complaints that the SRC had at the time was the lack of bus shelters for students waiting for buses in Belfield, particularly for the number 10 bus. Um, students would have to stand under Andre Wehert's canopy which was really built for a kind of a Florida sunshine climate to provide shade from too much sun. It was useless against horizontal rain uh, in, in midwinter, but that was the only place to shelter. You'd wait until the number 10 bus would arrive and then you'd scarper 40, 50 yards over and try and dash onto the bus without getting too soaked. So there were continuous complaints going from the SRC to the college authorities to build bus shelters, to get CIE to put up bus shelters. Uh, for whatever reason, I think the college was the one that was, was dragging its heels, that maybe, I don't know, could it have been Andre Weyhardt thought the bus shelters were a bit ugly? I, I have no idea. But uh, all, all entreaties were, were rebuffed. Um, and so being on the SRC, I had minutes of the SRC meetings saying, 
we need a bush shelter and nobody's doing anything about it. Um, Billy McGrath, who was a brilliant comedian, later involved in, in RTE, he would have been contemporary of Dermot Morgan's and would have been a real sparring partner with Dermot Morgan uh, for comedy, stand-up comedy in Theatre Rao. Um, I mean, there was great comedy scene in, in UCD at the time. Uh, he was, he was, um, he was the student's officer, which was, I suppose, guess, a mixture of the culture and welfare officer. There were three officers at the time. There was the president. And anyway, Billy and his girlfriend was Caroline Fisher, who was also involved in RTA for, for many years. But uh, Billy knew Derek Heavey, who was a classmate of mine, as was David Brown, uh, who's now the president of the Institute. And Derek and David are partners in, in RKD. And Derek was the go-between for a meeting between um, Billy, myself, and Michael de Courcy, um, which took place, I think, in Hartigan's pub in Lower Leeson Street, which was the, it was the architecture pub for for Earlsford Terrace. For, for Earlsford Terrace, it was where the architects drank, the medics drank across the across the street, and uh, at that in that pub over a couple of pints, and pints then were there were seventeen pence a pint uh, in the Belfield Bar, which was run by students. They were 19 pence in town, so they were a bit more expensive. And in, 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 if, you, if you had five pints for a pound in, in Hartigans, you had to walk home. But if you had five pints for a pound in the Belfield Bar, you could still get your bus fare home out of a pound, uh, which was kind of, you know, great value. But we had a few pints, and over, over, the, over the drinks, uh, we agreed with Billy that we'd operate a, a guerrilla action and build a bus shelter in Belfield to put it up to the authorities. And it was only possible because we were occupying Pembroke Street. Um, because in Pembroke Street, there was loads of timber from all the floorboards and the floor joists that had been uh, torn out by the developers in the partial demolition before we occupied. And they were all in the yard behind the houses. So we just commandeered that material and we, dis we designed a timber structure and then we needed to clad it. And so we thought Belfield was, everyone said Belfield was so grey in those days that we would have to do it colour and we would have to, because we were architects, we'd have to probably be all those colours. So it'd have to be red, blue and yellow. So the structure was the timber painted yellow. And uh, and then the walls, uh, well, we put the roof, the roof was going to be corrugated iron. So we painted that blue, which was strange because you'd think it should have been red. You know, I mean, now red would be the obvious colour for the, for, for the crinkly tin roof. Um, and then the red was reserved for the walls, um, which were made out of oil drums. And we had a fellow who was dropping in and out from time to time in Pembroke Street, and he had a van. And we went down one night down to the, to the, to the docks, and we stole a number of oil drums. And then we brought them back to Pembroke Street, and with an angle grinder, we split them down the middle. And then it would take four, four fellas, um, good-sized fellas, two on each end to jump up and down on the ends because the, the spring, the coil in the barrel is so strong to kind of break that, flatten it out um, so that you could use it as a, as a siding material. Uh, so it remained pretty crunkly, you know, when we were finished, but Maeve O'Neill painted them up all red, I remember. And then the thing was, well, how do you build it? Because, you know, if you go out there and you start building, you're going to have... First of all, it was, it was, it was February, late February, early March. Weather was terrible, the days were short. You were sure to have security come down on you in a flash. So we said it has to be a kind of a, a blitz installation. And how would you do that? And we decided, well, you'd have to do it in two phases. First of all, you'd have to get the foundations in um, so that you could just drop the structure more or less into place uh, and that it wouldn't fall over. And so to do that, we came up with the idea of paint cans, uh, which we would bed in concrete. So we went, out, uh, we went out one evening after dark, because this was easy to do, and the measurements only had to be pretty rough. Uh, but we had shaped the paint cans into kind of more rectangular shapes that would take the, the timber structure that would slot into it, and we could then wedge it with, with timber fillets at the bottom to fill out the space. And so we, we just, with a couple of shovels, a couple of us, we, we at our very rough measurements, we dug out, I think it was six foundation spots, um, put the paint can in the middle, level with the top of the grass, and filled in with the concrete all around and kicked some dirt back on it. And we left it there for two days hoping because it was at ground level, nothing would be seen and nobody would notice it. And obviously nobody did. And so two days later we came back when the foundations had set because you couldn't, you couldn't 
start putting the timber structure in and start rocking, uh, rocking the, 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 the unset concrete for the foundations. Uh, we came with the timber structure, the columns um, uh, partially assembled, dropped them into place, dropped the roof beams in and then started hammering uh, the, 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 the cladding onto it. And it went up in about two or three hours and attracted very little attention. But then the buildings officer and security did arrive and said, what's going on here? And so Michael de Corsi and myself um, basically took the, the leadership role on it because I was on the SRC and Michael was really leading in, in Pembroke Street. And we had done some projects together, so we were very good friends. And I said, we're just doing what the SRC has asked us to do. And they said, we know nothing about this. Uh, I said, well, you know, I have minutes from the SRC of, of continual requests for bus shelters and nothing's been done. And so we're just doing what the students are demanding should be done for UCD. And so we were marched off into Joe McHale, the secretary's office. He was furious when we went in and I was really anxious, you know, didn't know, would you actually get expelled for, for, for doing something like this? Um, and anyway, I stuck to the same line um, that I was on the SRC and I have the SRC minutes and you've been notified and you've done nothing and the students demand and it's not right that it's not been done. Didn't quite know what to do with that and then he said, and who are you? And Michael said, Michael de Corsi. He said, you're not related to Sean de Corsi, um, who was our professor of civil engineering, structural engineering here in the school, and of course Michael was. And they just didn't know what to do with us. And so we were let go and they said, you'll be hearing from us. And the only thing we ever heard afterwards was back from Billy McGrath to say that three or four days later, there was a big wind and one of the roof panels took off in the wind and had there been students under it, they could have been deca decapitated. So it was really kind of foolhardy, the risk we took, you know. Now, I still don't believe that the panels could have, could have blown off because, you know, they weren't just nailed on. Um, but anyway, that happened. And within an hour, the thing had been demolished by UCD. But the funny thing was that within two or three weeks, two bus shelters were installed on the site by CIE, so it worked. Yeah, the, 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 well, the campus was always kind of windblown. Um, you really did feel not so much that you were in suburbia, but that you were out in the country. And that was partly because it was just a big, flat, open farm, effectively, without hedges. Um, one of the great triumphs, subsequently, of the last 50 years, has been the landscaping plan for for Belfield. I mean, that has transformed it. It has been more successful, in my view, than most of the architecture has been. Um, Andre Fahert's admin building was a very fine building, um, but it has had a pretty brutal extension uh, on the lakeside, on the corner, added to it since, not a lot of respect. The AIB bank, the little bank that was beside it, was also very fine. It was a lovely, lovely little thing. It was probably the smallest thing on the on the campus, but it was really nice. Still is, I think, but not used to the same extent that it was in, the, in, in my days as a student. Um, the arts block was always a challenge. Um, logically and architecturally, it, you know, it makes sense with the separate houses off their stairs and the courtyards and everything like that. But, and, and the concrete was wonderful. I mean, it, it had the, 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 the coffer ceilings were extraordinary, um, really high quality. Um, the best, I mean, they're better than anything in the Barclay Library in terms of quality. Uh, the, the, the technology had moved up a big jump. Uh, if you look at the, like dribble marks on, on some of the pores on the, on the white concrete in, in, in no, with the exception, the, the, the columns in the Barclay Library are out of this world, but the coffers in the arts block are every bit as good, really, really good. Um, the quarry tiles, of course, were very typical of the time and a great choice for material. Um, I mean, in Louisiana, the art museum outside Copenhagen, done the late 50s, it had used the quarry tiles like that as well. Quarry tiles are, are baked, uh, baked clay floor tiles, hard wearing um, material because uh, the arts block used to be kind of described less as a piece of architecture than, uh, than more like a, an interchange, a transport interchange. The, the reference always was that at lecture turnover times that it was like a train station. And 
you had volumes of people moving like that. So it's not a normal sort of a building um, and its materials have to be very well chosen for that reason. What was not good was the wayfinding. Um, it was very confusing between the theatres until you knew and L, M and Q and you know, terrible names for theatres somehow. It just it made it kind of a little bit robotic. Uh, there were no social spaces in it. You had to really go to the library or you had to go to the restaurant or to the student bar, which was just a terrapin building, um, which the students themselves had put up under Frank MacDonald. Uh, Frank MacDonald was, was, uh, has his membership number 00001, and the first member of the, of the, of the committee that established the, the bar in Belfield, which was the most profitable bar in Dublin at the time. Um, captive audience and people played pool and all that sort of stuff in there as well. Really grotty, but uh, you know, everyone gravitated there, all the, all, at least all the less conscientious students. But the other thing about the arts block was that the courtyards were either too small or the glass had a tint in it or the windows weren't washed because it always felt like the light was grey. I mean they should have been sparkling interiors. If you think of little vitrines that like O'Donnell and Toomey have in the East Wall Community Centre and how they're planted um, and they just explode light into the interior um, pa passages and corridors of that building. So we did a student project, a vertical, we had a vertical, we used to run a vertical project in the school in those days for, for a fortnight or so. Each of the students would, each of the years would all work together in different teams and different projects. It was basically a unit system for a fortnight in a school that didn't have a unit system, but had a year system. Um, but Michael de Corsi and I, decided again in 1976 and it was, it was not unrelated to the, to the, to the bush shelter business uh, and to Billy McGrath and all of that to look at humanising the arts block. So we had in Earlsford Terrace, we had a series of, they were timber blocks, they were like big, uh, big timber blocks, hollow plywood with two holes in them and you could put a rod through them and you could build walls. So they were kind of like, a, before there was a building lab, there didn't, wasn't a building lab in Rosford Terrace. It was the closest we had to a building lab. But you could build walls and enclosures um, with, with these plywood and, and, and steel rods. And so we brought them out and we brought out some furniture, um, uh, Victorian furniture and things like that. And we set, we, we cut out kind of very bad sub woodstock lettering type things and we put a fireplace on a wall or we put up living room and we put the furniture in and we just watched what the, the students did um, and they, they took it over. And I remember Cahill O'Neill, obviously he must have got a word from, from, from Belfield uh, because Cahill came out and uh, he asked for Michael and myself to lead the president of the university through the installation for how it had humanised uh, the arts block. And that was when I think they started to think inside that they had to do more with, with the buildings. Now, unfortunately, over the years, they haven't always entrusted that work to the best architects um, that they might have. So that was the arts block. So it was a good building, but it was a very challenging building at the same time. <clears throat> Restaurant was extraordinary. Uh, it, was, it was really beautiful. Um, it was one of the first to be vandalised though because Bobby Bala had these wonderful, had made these wonderful, been commissioned to make these wonderful uh, plywood screens that were mobile so that you could subdivide the, the, the dining room and all of that sort of thing and they could be taken out for uh, concerts and dances at, uh, at the weekends. They could be just wheeled to one side and they were beautiful and then someone came in and just painted all over them. Uh, you know, clueless, clueless carry on. Um, but it was the, it was the, the restaurant was the social hub at the weekend, you know, I remember going to see George Melly there and various blues bands, Tin Lizzy I think, um, you know, everyone who was kind of passing through, they either played the National Stadium, if they were very big, or they played the Belfield Bar, and Billy McGrath was brilliant, he knew all the musicians, he was UCD, um, kind of social affairs officer in effect. 
Um, so he, his job was was to lay on fun. He was he was he was the he was the minister for fun in in, in Belfield. Um, so it was fantastic, but it got shut down eventually because of um, structural concerns that the building had not been designed, uh, particularly when punk came in, for rhythmic pogo dancing of you know 1,500 people on the floor going up and landing at the same time. And the engineers were called in and said, no can do. So the, the dances and concerts were banned completely after that, um, which was a shame, but unforeseen design. Um, the library was good. Um, it was open then, it hadn't been messed around with. It had an open arcade on the ground floor um, and uh, there, were, there were no barriers. It was a kind of a free flow building. Um, I liked it a lot, uh, Basil Spence's building. Spence and Lover, I think, yeah. Um, it was good. The earliest building on this, and the water tower was amazing. Well, the water tower was is is, is probably the, uh, with the exception of the restaurant building, is probably the finest thing on the whole site. Um, just because it's a it's a kind of a real challenging form, because it's hard to understand. It's not symmetrical. It's asking questions. It's asking you, how is it changing shape, and what's the difference between the top half and the bottom half. Um, so symbolically, I thought for a university, it was uh, it was a really good shape because it, it makes people ask a question the minute they come onto the campus. You know, so it's not clearly not a factory. A factory wouldn't do something as kind of. I mean, it's totally logical, incredibly logical, but it's on the surface of it irrational. And then, uh, but everything that the Weyherts did was rooted in in really strict geometry, um, and that. I put down to their Eastern European training. I mean, it's something you see in Polish architecture. Um, so I think that's something they brought with them, the, with them this kind of mathematical, geometrical uh, um, interest and, and almost obsession, you know. A very different obsession to, let's say, Ronnie Tallon's uh, classical world, um, golden section, double square type of, geometry. This is a much more angular geometry. If you think of Czech purism, or Czech expressionism, in, 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 in between the wars and the angles that come into that, that's, that's the mindset, that's the Central European um, attitude. It's no surprise that they're good at uh, chess and things like that. You know, um, they, they have other skills and they think in, in other ways. And that's, that's a really fundamental thing, I think, with, with Weyhertz. Um, architecture but the great the, the really the, the, the staggering thing is the quality of the water tower concrete and that it was all slip formed you know it's one pour you start at the ground with that skinny column and you keep pouring and pouring and pouring and you, you go the whole way up there's no joints you know it's it's a continuous pour so it's technologically you know out of this world uh, pushing pushing engineers and builders uh, to a level they hadn't ever been pushed before in Ireland. And that's something that like, neither the arts block nor the admin building do. You know, they, they're, maybe there you can see more the, the safe hands of Andy Devan, of an experienced architect uh, using, you know, precast aggregate panels for cladding and things like that. Whereas in the water tower, you see Vehard Levin rip with what he's really interested in.